Whenever we hear about the country Armenia, the word genocide often echoes in many people's minds, but many of us still do not know that although the killing of Armenian Christians happened back in 1915, history is repeating itself today in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The situation is so serious, Armenians are burning their own homes instead of surrendering, surrendering them. But our first guest is an Armenian journalist and is able to shed some light on this Armenian uh, conflict. She is live from Amman, Jordan. Thank you so much, Aline, for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So Aline, the situation in Armenia is devastating. Although COVID and elections have taken center stage globally, um, can you give us an idea of what the situation in Armenia is like right now? Well, this, this conflict has, you know, suddenly burst out into a full, like, war for the past 44 days since uh, started on September 27 and ending on November 9. And during this war, uh, 150,000 Armenians were affected. Some of them lost everything they have in their cities and towns, and some of them managed to... Uh, uh, take the bus ride to Armenia, which is a very, very long way. It's about 10 to 12 hours uh, by bus or car, and that's how they escaped the shelling. Uh, some of them, of course, stayed in their towns and villages, and um, many kids and moms died in a hospital in a maternity ward that was shelled, and uh, some of them refused to just re leave. They said, we will not leave our towns, we will not leave our churches, and we will stay here to defend them. So it's a very dire situation for the ones who have left and winter has started. Right. And a church has also been attacked, we hear? Yes. In the city of Shushi, uh, there was a big uh, church that we have there built about 110 years ago that was shelled and it completely, the dome was completely destroyed. Mm. And uh, that's the ironic thing about it, that uh, this church is actually older than Azerbaijan itself, because Azerbaijan became a country in 1918 only. Right. While Armenian churches and monasteries, some of them date back to the fourth and fifth century after Christ. So it's like um, people are having to leave like their heritage behind, not just their homes. Mm. And, and why is November 9th considered a sad day for Armenians around the world? Well, as you mentioned, the Armenians suffered the genocide in 1915, and they lost uh, nine-tenths of their historic homeland mm -hmm. at the time. So the ones who were lucky just walked, you know, through the Arabian deserts, and they, they reached the Middle East, and the later on they emigrated to other countries. So... So now they seem to be losing yet another part of their homeland. I mean, it's not as if that was enough. Now we have this uh, conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, which the Armenians call, the, call Artsakh. And, uh, and there were Armenians in Nakhichevan as well, which is also now part of Azerbaijan. I mean, it was like a political map which was redrawn in 1921. And that's how the Azeris got control of Nagorno-Karabakh and Nakhichevan. I mean, anyone who looks at the map would see that Nakhichevan is not even connected to Azerbaijan, and it's part of it. So Armenians, for Armenians, these are ancestral homelands. Uh, actually, in Karabakh, we have the first Armenian school was established there after the Alf Armenian alphabet was, you know, written down uh, in 406 AD. So you're talking about people who have built 4,000 monasteries, churches, cathedrals, and castles in Karabakh. Right. And yet, you know, the Azeris have the audacity to claim that this is their land. So it's sad that the people are having to leave their homes again. They're even carrying church bells. You know, they ca you cannot really carry them. And uh, one, one uh, bishop has said, I will not leave. I will either take these with me because they're 800 years old, or I'm going to stay here and defend them and probably die. Wow. So, um, so Aline, what, yeah. do, what does the future hold for Armenians, and how do you think reconciliation can be possible? Well, unfortunately, the peace deal, well, it wasn't a peace deal. This deal that was struck by the Russians, and they made the Armenian sign, and like the majority of Armenians outside of Armenia, of course, everybody is against these uh, latest agreements. And uh, in Armenia proper, 17 political parties 
are up against one, the Prime Minister's party, and they have asked him to uh, relinquish, uh, not, I mean, let go of the ceasefire, but the, some of the terms are inagreeable to Armenians because they even give Turkey a landline through Nakhichevan and through Armenia to Azerbaijan. And this is a big, a big problem for Armenians. So as long as, you know, uh, peace is not uh, based on any fair deal, I do not see the peace continuing. And uh, unfortunately, we don't want to see another war, of course, because all those young lives were lost. Okay. Most of the soldiers were 20, 21 year olds, volunteers, you know. You know, this conflict is not getting a lot of media exposure here in Canada. What's your message for us and how can we help? I think the thing the world needs to do is recognize the area that's called Nagorno-Karabakh or whatever is left of it after this final, you know, redrawing of the map again uh, on November 9th, to recognize it as Armenian land, either give them self-autonomy of or give the people self-determination or as per UN, you know, rules and regulations, uh, or just, you know, uh, if the people want to be part of Armenia, they would vote for it in a referendum later on. But the, the actual final status of the area has not been decided. Mm. And since it's that way, we will see another war again, because after the Russian peacekeepers leave in five years, or maybe before or after, another war will start again. Okay. Aline Banayan, uh, freelance journalist, joining us from Amman, Jordan. Thank you again for your insights today. Thank you.